I was asked to give you a few disease management updates, and the updates I have for you are related to rust, white mold, and SCN, and certainly if there's time, we can talk about other things as well. Um, rust is important because it tends to be more common in warm, dry years. You have some really excellent work going on at the Carrington Research Extension Center for white mold. A lot of it's with optimization, and I think that's maybe the most important thing I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to show you where to get more of that information. And then with soybean systematode, there is some new information about the susceptibility of different market classes and some of the varieties that we grow. And so I'll share that with you along with an update on where SCN is and where it's moving. So starting with rust. So the first thing about rust is that rust needs dew needs free moisture. It doesn't need rain. So if you have a really, really significant drought, you might not see rust, but rust likes it when it's warm and when it's dry. It needs that heavy dew, fog, when the canopy's closed, there's a really favorable mi microclimate and it likes it warm. So we see more rust when it's warm. Now I'm showing you on this picture, a leaf of a sunflower. So it's not dry bean, obviously you can probably see that, but just a reminder that rust is very specific to dry beans. So why I'm showing you the sunflower leaf is a good illustration of the environment that rusts need. So even though sunflower rust only affects sunflower and dry bean rust only affects dry beans, they need the same conditions. So I was walking through a field, I saw this leaf that was horizontal to the ground and it had a depression in it, this kind of lower like divot, maybe about the size of my thumb. And it was flat to the sky and had dew in it. And I thought, this is excellent. So you see, where there was a little bit longer dew, probably not even that much longer, you have a raging rust epidemic in that depression, but not on the rest of the leaf largely. And that's because it's so sensitive to that free moisture, that, that heavy dew. So it becomes important in warm, dry years. So rust in dry beans is a little bit different than the cereal rust. We don't need this thing to blow up from South Dakota like with leaf rust of wheat. This one can overwinter where, where we're at. And when it does, it shows up in the season as a hot spot. So kind of unlike the cereal rust where they seem to appear everywhere all at once, this one shows up on the lower leaves of little spots where it might overwinter. Now, lots of times you see this along a field edge. This, I took a, this photo a long time ago and it just happened to be in the middle of a field, probably where some residue is at. So it's really hard to see a hot spot, even though you're standing pretty close, you know, and as I get closer, you can kind of see what's going on, but really you have to get into that middle canopy and start grabbing those leaves because rust is going to be where that microclimate is super favorable and, it, and in the canopy, it's going to be wet longer. And so rust, the top of this leaf is covered with rust. You can see these kind of cinnamon brown pustules with the yellow halos and a whole lot more pustules coming. And um, it's just, it's classic rust. And if you flip it over, the pustules will be even more significant. So this is a picture I took near the Devil's Lake area, maybe four, three, four, five years ago. Rust showed up. It was a little bit late, but still was early enough to cause some major problems. So this field was hit hard with rust. And when rust shows up late, it's more of a defoliant than anything else. But you can see the leaves are hit, the pods are hit. You can see pustules everywhere. So rust definitely caused some yield loss in this field and it certainly has yield loss potential and it has yield loss potential every year. So it's something to definitely keep an eye on. So the way we manage rust is we talk about crop rotation, that's very critical, but rust do blow. So it's not, you know, it's not a silver bullet. Genetic resistance is excellent when it works. So we had great genetic resistance in the 90s and the 2000s. There was a race change that happened in the last decade. So a lot of our varieties are susceptible. When the environment flares up and there's rust around, it could be a problem. So fungicides become an option and fungicides are very good. Uh, the most important thing here I would say is the timing. So when you're looking at rust in a field, if you see it, if you see it usually in July, you might see it if a wetness event occurs, you know, rain on the 10th of July or something, you have a little time and you can spray it. Preventative applications can help, but you can totally miss it as well. I mean, a lot of fields won't get rust at all, and then you're just kind of throwing money away. So I would encourage everyone to scout, and if you find it, you can manage it. Now, when like pintos start to stripe, for example, then fungicides are no longer effective, the plant's just too far gone. 
but it is in those early half of the reproductive stages that it's really important. And there's multiple chemistries that are effective. And I'm just gonna show you the last trial where we had some rust, we didn't have any really last year. We were testing some of the new products plus onset, onset's generic tebuconazole. And the way you'd read this graph is you've got the product and you've got the rate. You've got the severity here. It's not super high severity, but it's enough to separate out some of these chemicals. And you can see some of these products are really quite excellent. And there's a lot of data about this. And if Russ shows up this summer, uh, we will have information about these products and certainly you can get the information elsewhere as well. In the trial of 2020, our dry beans had other problems. You can see we did not have statistical differences in yield, but you can see numerically there were, there were some yield differences here. So we've got good chemicals. The biggest thing is to just scout for rust. All right, switch into white mold. So just an update on how this thing works again. So right now we've, we've got some frozen ground that's soon gonna thaw out. And if there's been white mold in the last five, seven, maybe nine years, there's probably some risk for white mold because these black structures, these sclerotia are the survival mechanism of the pathogen and they're in the field. And so when they germinate in the spring, when you get those wet soils, you'll produce these little mushrooms. And these little mushrooms release the spores and that's the weak part of the system. So the spores will be released from the mushrooms and they can't infect healthy green tissue. They need flower petals, okay? These will germinate if you have wet soil before bloom. So this is another example from a sunflower. It's the same pathogen, does the same thing to dry beans, but I'm walking through another sunflower field and there's a floret on a leaf that's horizontal to the ground and the spores landed on this floret and caused the infection here and then it spread to the healthy green tissue, okay? So essentially think of your dry beans as being basically resistant to white mold until bloom. And then it becomes very important to think about a fungicide application if the, if the weather is conducive. It needs those flower petals and it's cool and wet. When we have a cool and wet year, white mold becomes a pretty huge risk. And then from here, you know the story, right? The beans or any of the plants for that matter, you'll see the white fuzzy growth, you'll see the dry bone colored lesions, and then you'll see these black sclerotia again in the cycle will repeat. And those things will last, like I said, for half a decade to maybe a decade. Okay, so managing white mold with fungicides, a few things, favorable conditions, timing is important, and bloom stages are critical. And we're gonna talk about that. Fungicide efficacy, I'm not gonna get into this, but there's a tremendous amount of data out there. I would say the most important thing is don't cut rates. We, we've seen over and over and over again with a lot of the work that's been done, especially work at Carrington, there is a big difference in efficacy when you use a higher or medium rate than versus a lower rate. And multiple chemistries are effective and that's again available. The resources that I would all point you to is the Carrington Research Extension Center and Dr. Michael Bunch is, he's a world leader in this area and he's going to be updating this website very soon with a lot more information on not just dry beans, but other crops as well. All right, there is another resource that I would encourage you to check out. So the North Harvest Bean Grower Magazine was just released, the 2022 Dry Bean Research Reports. And this is available on their site and you can click on that QR code and I will put that up again if you wanna take a look at this yourself. And again, I would encourage you to do so. In this, in this issue, Michael's got like this seven page spread where he's got information on optimizing the application timing, the droplet sizes and the spray volume. And he's been able to show statistically significant and important yield differences just based on optimizing that chemical. And I, I would consider this extremely important because those chemicals are expensive, the input's expensive and takes a lot of time. You will get more bang for your buck if you optimize that application. So I would encourage you to check this out. So I'm gonna go through two of these tables just to show you how to interpret this, but then I hope that you go, I hope that you go to this after. So I'm gonna start, and I'm just talking about the application timing as an example. So I'm gonna start with the results and then I'll show you the tables and then I'll go back to the results. And so I'm just gonna let Michael do the talking here. <clears throat> so in this regard, the best predictors of optimum fungicide application timing were percent canopy closure with the percent of plants with one or more initial pods. In Pintos, and so he's done this work in other market classes as well, when the canopy was at or near closure, when the first pin-shaped pods were developing, White mold management and pinto bean yield were optimized when fungicides were applied when approximately 15% of the plants had initial pin-shaped pods. 
Okay, so at or near closure, about 15% of the pot plants have pin shaped pods was optimized. However, when the canopy is open, when, <coughs> You know, so less than 95% of the ground. When the first pin-shaped pods were developing, white mold management driving were optimized when fungicide applications were delayed until 50% of the plants had initial pin-shaped pods. Okay, so based on canopy closure and the size of the pin-shaped pod, the amount of pin-shaped pods, he showed some differences. So we'll walk you through these two tables here. So the first one is in the closed canopy experiments that he's conducted. Here you've got white mold, percent canopy. So the first half of this for the top, kind of top half is talking about the white mold and percent of the canopy, okay? So this is the damage. How much white mold is there? Here you've got yield. So the bottom half of this is you've got the yield data, okay? And then you have the treatments. So in each case, you have a non-treated control, right? And then you've got some timing applications. So here's the initial timing, so singles. And here, you see, here you've got the second, okay? Application A plus 10 or 14 days later, all right? And it, it's replicated down here as well. Okay, so if we look at this, so this is the percent white mold in canopy. Remember, this is a closed canopy. So you've got this application timing. You've got plants with initial pin pods. So 0%, 15, 1600. You've got percent canopy closure as well. In the non-treated control, 84% of the canopy's got white mold. But <clears throat> It's a little, it's at 0%, statistically the same. But at 15, 60, 100% of the plants with initial pin pods, there's a statistical difference. You go to the second application, that statistical difference even becomes a little bit greater. So here's a different way to look at it. So this is essentially the same data. On the left-hand side, he's got plants with initial pin pods. <clears throat> this is the fungicide application timing, 0, 15, 60, and 100. Here's a single fungicide application. So if you delayed it to 15% with pin pods or later, it's optimal. It's a 7% reduction in disease. And here you have the same thing with two applications. Okay, so let's look at the yield. So here you've got an on tree control with just under 1300 pounds an acre. Application A, so no pin pods, a little less closed canopy is the same. There's no statistical increase. You wait till you've got these pin pods, 1560, you've got a statistical increase here, and that's pretty significant. You know, that's four, five, 600 pounds. Here you've got the same kind of thing. Here's the other way to look at it, right? So you've got the increases in yield. So you wait till you've got, you wait till you've got some of those pin pods and that yield goes way up. You wait till 100% of them and it starts to drop. The same thing is true when you have two applications, okay? Make sense? I hope that makes sense. If the canopy's open, the story's a little different. So here you've got the same thing. You've got an open canopy, you've got the same setup and design. So here's the severity, here's the yield. You've got your three application types. You've got a non-treated, you've got the initial timings here, you've got a two application timing here. And you can see the longer you wait in an open canopy to the point where the initial pin pods are 80, about 80%, you're, you're increasing, you're reducing your disease severity, right? The same thing holds true here, and then take a look at the yield, right? So Michael color codes these things. So you can see statistical difference is easy, but you can also see with the letters. If you're waiting a little bit longer with an open canopy, you're optimizing that fungicide application. And here you can see the increases in, in with the uh, the delaying and delaying and delaying, you have your highest yield increase if you wait till most of them have pin pods when the canopy is open. It doesn't matter if it's one application or two. So I'm gonna go back to that. So this is an example of what he's got. So again, with Pintos, when the canopy was at or near closure, the optimal application was about 15% of the plants had pin pods, but when it wasn't, it was more about 50. And so he has data like this on all the market classes, well, the common market classes of dry beans we work on. It's just, and it's just excellent. And I would, I would suggest you go take a look at some of this. Okay, the other, dis the other disease I'm gonna give you an update on is soybean cyst nematode. So we all pretty much know this story by now. So soybean cyst nematode is a parasitic worm. 
So I'll give you a here. This is a healthy nodule on a soybean, actually. So this is a soybean photo, but here's SCN. It looks the same on dry beans. We know soybean cyst causes problems on dry beans. This is a photo that was taken in a kidney field uh, just on the Minnesota side of the river. A little, little Cliff Notes version on SCN. You've got this parasitic worm that infects soybeans and dry beans, and it's actively expanding. It's soil borne. So anything that moves soil can move this. So that could be equipment or wind or water, and it's moving through our region. It's favored by high pH, warm weather, and dry conditions. And we had a lot of SCN last year, a lot of SCN problems. And if we have the same conditions or similar as we did last year, this is only gonna be exacerbated. One thing to remind you is you don't have to have above ground symptoms until it's bad. In soybeans, we talk about taking a 30% yield loss before you see above ground symptoms. We don't have data like that on dry beans, but I suspect that you can have SCN on dry beans and not know it for quite a while. So a little history about SCN, it's not from here. It was an invasive pathogen that was first found in the 50s. And it was first found in North Carolina, but the Boot Heel of Missouri the northeast corner of Arkansas is where it really got established. And this is the Mississippi River Valley. And you can see that there is a lot of soybeans here. And once it got established there in the late 50s, early 60s, it was going to spread throughout the rest of the soybean growing region. So I'm going to show you a little bit about where it's at, but I want to keep, keep the couple numbers in your head first. So when it got to North Dakota in 2003, there was a bunch of work done on SCN. And part of that was done on dry beans trying to figure out how much of an impact it would have on dry beans. And so this is an experiment that Berlin Nelson did almost 15 years ago now, where he took pinto beans and put them in a pot with different levels of eggs, SCN eggs. So here you have a healthy bean with no SCN. Here you've got a pinto bean, same variety, same everything, treated the same with 5,000 eggs per 100 cc's of soil. And here you've got another pinto with 10,000 eggs in the soil. Okay, so just kind of keep this 10,000 egg level in your mind. So the North Dakota Soybean Council has supported a survey since 2003, and almost 5,000 samples have been sent in by the growers. This is a grower-based thing. The way it works is the Soybean Council will provide a bunch of eggs, NDSU Extension distributes them, a grower, a consultant, whomever can pick them up from Extension, they're pre-marked, pre-labeled, they can go sample their field, send them into the lab. The lab we're using is Eggvise, and then Eggvise will send you your data directly. And we just make a map of distribution. And so what I wanna point out here, a couple things. The first is that the blacks are negative. All these blacks are negative, which is about two thirds of the samples we usually receive. The gray boxes are really low level positives that you could call inconclusive. And I call them inconclusive when we talk to growers about it. So. If you get a gray box, 50, 100, 150, sample again. But the colors are real. And so you can see how colorful it is in the southeast corner, but you also see these low level positives, these green triangles, and even some medium level positives like this blue circle showing up outside the valley. And of course, the concern here is that there's a ton of dry beans being produced in the northeast corner. So SCN is expanding. We did a little heat mapping and just, it helps to visualize where it is. Um, but this doesn't mean that if you're, even if you're in a red spot, that does not mean you have SCN. Just remember, this is very field specific and random, but I would look at this as just a general risk and it's moving north and west. Okay, to manage SCN, we are encouraging everyone to sample and the best time to sample is near harvest. And that's because SCN lives in the soil and it reproduces, it runs that life cycle a couple turns during the growing season. So if you're looking for it for the first time, your levels will be highest at the end of the season. And you wanna focus on areas where you're likely to find it first, where soil might move in, such as a field entrance, blowing through a shelter belt, flood water, that sort of thing. And if you're gonna sample six to eight inches deep, aim for the roots, it's different than fertility sampling. Okay, so to manage it, we talk about crop rotation. We have talked about resistance and market classes. And that's the update that I have for you here. There is a video that you can check out about SCN and dry beans that was put together about five years ago. Um, if you want to take a look at that, there's a little bit more detail on how SCN and dry beans work together. Okay, so let's go back to this North Harvest Research Report publication. Same one that had the white mold updates. One of the last projects that Dr. Berlin Nelson did before he retired was to look at some of the susceptibility of these different market classes and different varieties. And so this is all just very new. We had some data uh, 
early data, maybe five, six, seven years ago. This is just more and it's probably better. Just it's been just more research. So he took a lot of different varieties from a great number of market classes and he tried to evaluate them for susceptibility to SCN. And how we do this is we calculate something called the female index. So essentially we take all these beans, we grow them in pots, we put the female worms, the eggs in there, and then they will reproduce on the dry beans, right? And then we compare to see how well basically the female likes it. How well can that female uh, reproduce on it? And what we compare it to then is a susceptible check, a truly susceptible soybean check. That truly susceptible check would be at 100, which is not even on this scale, okay? But how you should interpret this is that you have your, have your bean market classes here. If you have a bean market class that falls into this area, the bean would be considered resistant, just like a resistant soybean, like a truly resistant bean. If the female index falls into this 10 to 30%, we would generally classify it as a moderately resistant, okay? 31 to 60 would be moderately susceptible. And then anything above 60 would be a true susceptible. But what you see is a lot of our beans, the bean class in general, are kind of at this cusp of moderately resistant, moderately susceptible. So while you can certainly get SCN and SCN damage in the dry beans, it's not gonna look like a susceptible soybean that melts down. And this is all really good news. The next graphic that I'm gonna share from you, and it, it's a little fuzzy and I'm sorry, I just clipped that from the PDF file, is the average female index among some different dry bean varieties. And again, you've got this female index. Now you've got the female index going up to 90. Remember hundred is like a completely susceptible soybean check. So you've got a lot, a lot of varieties here and I would, I would encourage you to visit that magazine. Any variety that falls in here would be resistant and, and there are none. There are some that are close, but there are none. This would be a moderate equivalent of a moderately resistant variety. Yeah. You've got some that would fall into the moderately susceptible category. And then of course you've got one that would be a true susceptible, at least in this experiment. That's all I have for you today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Again, that QR code for that North Harvest Bean Grower Magazine, the research reports is there. And there's a lot of information in there about what I presented and other things. And I would encourage you to take a look and see some of that for yourself. Mm -hmm.